Hi, my name is Blake Adams. The client that we chose to work with is Andre Husni. He owns Jacob Springs Farm, which is located in Boulder. Here's a picture of his farm where he has his house, his cottage, his pump house, and water tanks that are all connected by these water lines, shown in blue. The problem he presented us with is he needs to determine the level of water in the tanks throughout the day so then he is able to maintain a certain level of water pressure throughout the entire day for his entire farm. The unique approach that we chose to use is to plug a pressure sensor into this water line right here, open the valve, and collect data using a particle throughout the day so then we can determine what the water level is in the water tanks based on the pressures. Hello everyone, my name is Kevin Murphy. I'm going to be talking a bit about our data that we've collected so far with our pressure sensor and our understanding and interpretations of that data. All right, so on our first chart here, we've gathered PSI values over a three-week period at the end of March and into April. And as you can see, throughout each day, there are periods of time where the tank is draining, shown by these red arrows, and periods of time where the tank is filling, shown by these green arrows. Now, ideally, we never want our tanks to be completely empty, and we never want our tanks to be completely full to prevent overflowing and wasting of water. Uh, this, combined with the consideration we had to take to minimize the cycles that the tank was doing each day, led us to a target zone of pressure of about six to seven and a half PSI for daily use. We found three main sources of error in our data that we had to reduce in order to make our data usable. The first being frequent drops near zero pressure, which we think is linked to a, a, pump, a pressure pump inside of the house. The second being noise between individual measurements, which we're trying to reduce using both software and hardware components. <clears throat> And the third being repeated patterns that we see throughout each day. Uh, these are likely uh, linked to repeated water use, such as uh, flushing a toilet. Since our electronics need to be placed in a human environment, we needed a way to protect them. Our first iteration consisted of a way to securely hold the breadboard containing all the electronics and securely fasten the LCD screen. However, there was no way of having wires go in and out of our enclosure. The reason for this is due to manufacturing processes where we thought it would be easier to just drill a hole in the side of the enclosure rather than having the 3D printer print from the bottom up and have to dig out support material. We were unable to successfully drill a hole in the enclosure without breaking the enclosure. This led to the second iteration. This iteration consisted of two places to put screws and a way for wires to easily enter and exit the enclosure, which we could easily seal up with some hot glue. Due to the pandemic, we were unable to manufacture this enclosure, so we resulted to plan B. We found an enclosure offline. This enclosure would not fit all of our electronics that we currently had. This leads to the wiring. Our current setup is a breadboard consisting of the resistors, the transducer wires, and the photon. We wanted to make this a little more compact, so we developed a PCB. So as, as Inch said, we've created a PCB and sent it out to Osh Park Boardhouse where it's being printed and should arrive within the next week. So we should have plenty of time for assembly. However, let's talk about our actual circuit. So our circuit contains many parts, including an LCD screen and an I2C bus. So let's zoom in a little bit closer. There's three main parts to our circuit. The first is a decoupling capacitor, which levels out the voltage coming from our power brick. The second is our RC circuit, which smooths over any noise in our analog data, and has a time constant of 30 seconds. And last is our voltage divider, which linearly steps down our analog voltage from the 4.5 volt lo logic of the pressure transducer to the 3.3 volt logic of the photon. So now I'll pass you off to Keaton, who's going to talk about programming. Hi, my name is Keaton, and I focus on the software side of our project. Andrew Brown helped out quite a lot, and our client Andre gave invaluable insight as well. Below you can see all of the data we collected, and it has quite a lot of high frequency noise. So most of my code focused on filtering out this noise. The code is centered around uh, one array that collects five minutes of data. It starts out as all zeros and is filled with values as they're collected. Um, an average is calculated, a standard deviation is calculated, the sum of all of these values is stored, and the number of entries is stored as well. Throughout the process, 
new values are added on, and a new average is calculated as long with a new standard deviation in the sum and the counter updated as well. By filtering out what values we decide to enter the array, we can make better decisions on what the true value of the pressure in the pipes are and therefore how full the tanks are. And this helps us um, monitor the, uh, the tanks and decide whether the pump should be on or off. Well, these so the biggest way that our group could have improved would have been to be taking data earlier on in the process so then we had more time to analyze it. Also, we should have been using Andre's particle account so then we could communicate with the other particles located on his farm as well as reference code. We also should have been starting with the photon rather than the Arduino because later on we had to switch from the Arduino to the photon, which cost us time. The biggest ways that our team grew over the design process was through our communication and distribution of labor. This increased drastically when we moved to remote learning because we had to communicate much more and do everything online rather than in person.